Good. So, uh, and Yuri, uh, you invited me to, to, to talk about design driven innovation, and, and, uh, and I will talk about that research and that book that I've been writing a few years ago. Uh, but before coming here, and this is a conference on digitalization and, and, and design and creativity. And, but before coming here, you know, sometimes reality is stronger than you. Uh, and, uh, and a friend sent me during the weekend this, uh, this uh, actually an article from the New York Times that pointed to this uh, piece of art. Maybe you've been reading this article uh, about this uh, painting that has been awarded uh, an art uh, award in Colorado by this uh, known artist whose name is Jason Allen, who's nothing to do with art, but has been using uh, an artificial intelligence uh, machine to create this uh, painting. And, uh, and of course, this spurred a lot of reflection, critique, oh my god, you know, now all art will be destroyed, and, and all these kind of things. So, so this reality and this question and, and this debate, which is we will talk also at lunch today, uh, it is high in the mind of people. So I couldn't avoid to, to, to do a reflection. So what I will share here, and actually the first time I will share this reflection. So this is a premiere uh, uh, as a kind of vernissage. Uh, wh what can this kind of uh, events uh, in which technology gets into the space of creativity uh, create, and I will rec reconnect this to some of the research I've been doing in the past, but try to explain and, and make some hypotheses of what can come after this. So first of all, uh, uh, an example just, to, just to, to understand how to frame the reflection, because we, there is some theory that can help us to understand what's going on. A and I will try to connect to some theories of innovation. Because this is an innovation, okay, which goes beyond creativity. I, I will get back to this later. But it's an innovation, and especially an innovation driven by technology. And it's not the first time that that uh, um, that uh, technology has changed the world of creativity. I mean, if you think about the world of music, uh, I mean, the world of music is one of the most creative spaces you can have an image. You know, this is I mean, tons of creativity every day. I don't know how many thousands and millions of, of, of music is created. Uh, but this word a few years ago, uh, and then you can understand my age, was challenged by a technology. And this technology was uh, this one. Let me see if I can do this. This one. I mean, someone invented a, a machine, and particularly this machine is called Firelight, uh, to create digital music. Okay? So basically, you, didn't, you, you can have a, a drum, uh, and you can have you don't, didn't need to have a drummer anymore in a band because you can make music digitally. And nowadays we know it. we have garage band and all these kind of things. So, so what happened at that time is that as soon as <laughs> the same kind of quest, ah, oh, we are destroyed, there will not be drummers anymore in the world. We know how he went eventually. There, there are still drummers and they're well paid and very happy. And, uh, but at that time, everyone was, was shocked. Uh, and of course, the first application of this technology was exactly what is happening now, try to emulate the drummers. And everyone was trying to make, okay, what is the real perfect way a drummer hit a drum to make it perfect? And everyone was trying to play around this. But eventually, uh, one guy uh, came up with a different vision, and, and this gay guy, is, if you know, it's called Peter Gabriel. And he said, hold on a second. Maybe the meaning of this technology it's not just to substitute what a drummer was doing before. Maybe we can do new things with this technology. So he started to make experiments, and one of these experiments you see up there, uh, there is a TV screen inside this box, and here now he's smashing the TV. The TV. It, at that time, was still having the cathodic tube. Okay, it was not flat TV. It was the thick TV. So if you smash that uh, tube, there was an explosion. Okay and it's recording explosion, and then this kind of new sound, new percussion, went into his music. I think I have something here, let me see if it works. I need to do this. 
So what you hear here is, here is the sound of that explosion. Okay, that kind of sound never, no one ever heard. Okay, so it was not a, an emulation of a drummer. It was new sound that no one ever heard before. And from that, he created a new music, which was called world music, a mix of digital, technology, rock, ethnic music from Africa, uh, something we never saw. And, and it's a very interesting story because uh, when we think about change and innovation, uh, we, we only forget there are two different levels of change and innovation. One is what I call the level of solutions. There is a problem in front of us and we try to solve it better. So in the case of, the mu of music, I mean, we, we want to have some rhythm there. So we need to have a drummer and we need to have a better drummer and then if there is a digital machine, the first thing that comes to my mind is to our mind. How can we have a better, cheaper drummer? That's the first thing. But what Peter, Peter Gabriel did, instead of doing this strategy, which is typically called you know, substitution, and this happening is the, our question, of, oh, digital technologies, artificial intelligence will substitute painters, will substitute designers, will substitute architects. It's not really like this. Maybe a little bit. We will discuss about that later. But what is interesting, there is a second level of innovation, which is what I call a change in meaning. And this is what Peter Gabriel did. And this computer is hidden behind it. This is what Peter gave it is. So it's, it's what I call an epiphany. It's that every technology inside hides the possibility to change the reason why we do things, to change the meaning of things. And what Peter Gable here used this digital technology to change what we mean by percussion. And the percussion is not just what we know, it's a new thing. There are new sounds. You don't need to have a new drummer, you just invent new sounds. And these sounds will be used by a drummer. Okay, and it's, there are many, many examples of, even in business, I, I come from a business school, it, it, it's a classic. Whenever there is a new technology, the first applications are simply trying to do what we did before, better or cheaper. But the, the winner eventually is someone who understands, you know, the point of this technology is not just that, that's easy. The point of this technology is to expand possibilities, to create new meanings in what we do. Let's take a business example, just to make it very simple. Uh, a, a, a very old again, but in the 70s, these were a classic watch, and what is a watch? Something that you have to, maybe this is more a jewel, but something you have to, to take time of things. And when electric technology, electronic watches came out, the first application was, how? Wow, now we can do that better and cheaper. Okay, that was what happened in the late 70s. But then eventually what we know is that these watches are not what we, they want in the market. What won in the market was this one. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. We can use these, digit, these electronic technologies not to make a watch that is more precise and cheaper. We can use these digital technologies to have cheaper watches so you can have more than one. So eventually you spend the same amount of money as before. But you turn watches into fashion accessories, which now is obvious for us. But at that time, no one ever thought that you can use turn tech watches into fashion accessories, simply because it was too expensive. So technologies always have these two possibilities in innovation. We can do the same thing as we did before better, but we can also create this kind of epiphanies. An epiphany is, uh, uh, etymologically, an epiphany is a manifestation of the real meaning hidden behind something. I don't, in the, in the Catholic religion, uh, the epiphany is when the three kings come and they tell to the world, this is Jesus. Wow, now I, now I understand the meaning. It was hidden behind and finally is unveiled. So every technology is a potential epiphany. Someone needs to find it out. And we still don't know what is, coming back to our painting as before, we still don't know where the epiphany is in that case, okay? But uh, for sure, we are in front of just observing now the tipping point of a change that is a change that is disrupting the entire space of creativity. Okay. Uh, very similar to what happened uh, in, the, in the late 
19th century when the photographic camera was invented. And I can imagine the painters in that moment, oh, we are all lost. They will not be painting anymore. What happened at that time is that painting changed, of course. And those who were painting also changed. The people who, the great painters before the camera were not the same great painters after the camera. You had impressionists, you had abstractists, people started to paint what they had in their mind instead of painting what is inside, because there is already a camera that can take portrait of what is inside, but there's no camera that can take portrait of what you have inside your mind. So we are in a very similar situation, uh, and, and we have a few questions there. Okay, for art, given this is a conference and it's connected also to art, first of all, what is art then? Okay, is this art? I don't know, but I think there are more interesting questions, which is beyond art, what is creativity in general? Because the impact of this technology, artificial intelligence, goes beyond, I mean, the example we see now is more about connected to art, but I think it's even more powerful if you think about all kinds of creative activities, because it's all, about, all creative activities are based on imagination. And this is an imagination machine, which I started to use in my project when I worked with company with students about imagining ideas for products, for experiences. It's an imagination machine, so it goes beyond art, but everything that is connected to creativity. And second, beyond emulation, as I did before, is not simply how can we do the same thing we did before like a human. It's not that the point. How, what is the real meaning? What is the real epiphany that this technology can enable? That's another interesting question. And the third one, I think, is even the most important one. Who is really creative in this new world? Because the feeling I have is that this technology will change not just the way we create, but who we create. And it will change significantly. Who will create and how we distribute creation? How can we promote it around the entire network of cultural production? So it's a big change in the industry. With, I personally believe, with fantastic opportunity for the industry of creativity. Um, at least I have a daughter studying painting, so I mean, I have an interest in I'm trying to save her future through this kind of technology. So I have a continuous conversation. So, uh, a few. So, what is the? What are the questions that, that I would like? How do I, I would like to address? I we will never find a solution now, an answer to this question because they are too complicated. But just a little bit of you know to to make the conversation move forward. Uh, three reflections I would like to share with you. First one is, how does this, how do these epiphanies happen? How do you find a new meaning of a technology? Which is connected to my research that I did in the past about how this thing happens. So I will move a little bit more to the world of business to, to try to provide an explanation. So, but then I will go back to the world of creativity to say, okay, once we understand how these epiphanies happen, what are the challenges for this world of creativity? And hopefully, what are the unique opportunities that we have in front of us? Good? Are we on the same page? Good, so that's, let's start then. Okay, how do, how do epiphanies happen? How do you find a new breakthrough meaning when a technology occurs? So, uh, so it's not how do we solve problem better, but how do we find a new direction, new why, a new sense of what we do, okay? Which is totally different. We have been working on this a lot. Uh, as, as I said, uh, I, I work in a business school, so I work a lot on, on businesses. Uh, and, and the way we work, we, we, we do research, then we, we corporation ask us, can we do the same again? So uh, over the years, we have been working in basically every possible industry from consumer, business to business, uh, mar product, services. And, and what did we learn? First of all, we didn't work in general. We work on their design strategy, okay? So that's the reason why it's very close to here. And by design, I really means the creation of new meaning. I like the definition of Klaus Krippendorf uh, uh, because there are many possible definitions of design. So what I, what I empathize a lot is this one. It says that the etymology of design goes back to the Latin designare. Uh, and we still use it also in English, designate, I mean designate, okay? 
Uh, and what does it mean to designate? It means, you know, I designate you, the king uh, of Sweden, by using this crown. The crown is just a sign that gives meaning to you as the king of Sweden. So if we go back to this etymology, design is designare, we can say that design is making sense of things, is the creation of new meaning. So that's the reason why uh, I've been studying a lot of design and I call this kind of innovation design-driven innovation, not because it's about making things more beautiful, but be it's because it's answering the question, does it make sense? And by the way, I'm an engineer by education, so I'm quite used to work more down here as an education. How do you solve a problem better? F engineers are fantastic problem solvers. But they never ask the question, does it really make sense? That's not how you're trained as an engineer. You're trained to solve a problem at best. You never challenge the problem. Here instead, we are trying to understand, how do you make sense? Does it really make sense to substitute a drummer? Does it really make sense to emulate painting? What is the real meaning of what we are trying to do? Why we are doing what we are doing? So, what did we learn? We learned that when you try to change the meaning of things, the kind of mindset you're using is exactly the opposite of, what, of the mindset you try to ad adopt when you solve a problem. Okay? Typically, when you solve a problem, uh, uh, and here I go back to my education, you, you apply two kind of criteria. First of all, you try to understand the problem. <laughs> so you go to the user and try to understand what kind of problems the user have. And second, you try to be creative. So, okay, now I understand the problem, and I try to create as much idea as possible to solve this problem. When we move to the level of meaning, which is a level of sense-making, is not a level of promise solving, the criteria are exactly the opposite. Okay, so let's discuss those. So this is a classic video I took from, I, I took a couple of screenshots I took from a company, uh, from a video of a company called IDEO. Uh, I don't know if you heard, there has been a lot of reflection about design thinking and, and, and but it, IDEO uh, it is connected to Stanford, School of Engineering, you already know where I'm going, very rooted in engineering. And in fact, what they say is that when you want to improve, in this case, a shopping cart, you start from the user. If you want to improve a shopping cart, you go to the supermarket, take photos of the users, and, and, uh, and then uh, find a better solution. By the way, this is the solution uh, that they, is a famous video you can find it on YouTube. This is the solution they eventually found, which is a modular shopping cart because uh, one of these, actually this researcher observed that people in the supermarket leave the shopping cart there, go around, take the cookies, and go back. So they use the shopping cart as a hub. So they say, okay, we can support this behavior by making a modular shopping cart. You take the basket, look there, take the cookies, maybe also a little bit of pasta, and, and go back to the shopping cart. So it basically is what we call user-driven. Okay. It's outside in. You listen to the user or serve the user or whatever you do, and then you understand the problem. Well, there is a lot of research that shows that that kind of approach works for improving things to solving problems better, but it never works when you want to change direction, when you want to change the meaning of things. Uh, an example, I mean, you probably remember the Nintendo Wii. It was not a better... Uh, game console. I mean, if you look, take, took photos at that time of teenagers in their living room playing like this, okay, you discover there is still a finger there. There is, it's still doing nothing, and you improve the, you improve the remote control. But you will never get to the Nintendo Wii. And that was a totally different reason why you play. It's not to win. It's not to enter into another world. The Nintendo Wii was okay. I stay real and move and socialize. Uh, it's, it's more about movement than, than about moving your body, not about moving your fingers. Uh, to the point that traditional, traditional game player didn't like it. Because actually it makes gaming more accessible. So if you're a good, a good game player, uh, a geek, uh, then, then you don't have an advantage anymore. So it was totally different. And it actually was even worse in terms of graphics, if you remember. In t compared to a traditional uh, uh, game console, it was worse. But it was a new meaning. You play not because you want to become someone else, a tennis player, but because you want to be a tennis player yourself. It's not what's happening in the screen, it's what's happening in the room. And this is, I mean, this, this console was made possible by a component that is inside the remote control, which is called an accelerometer. It's a little chip that you have inside your phone, which is sensitive to movement. 
And, and the company who pro supported this is called ST Microelectronics. So it was ST Microelectronics going to Nintendo and saying, you know, we have this component. We can make a new, again, a technology that can change the meaning of gaming. It's not about entering into space. It's about being real and moving. Exactly the opposite. And this is the sentence of Bruno Morari, who's the inventor of the accelerometer. He say, if a client asks for a specific, specific feature or component, it means that someone else has really creative. What it means here is that it was not Nintendo going to them, can we have an accelerometer? And there was no consumer actually asking Nintendo for this. It was ST Microelectronic who went first to Microsoft to propose the same. Microsoft said, no, we are not interested because teenagers play like this. And then, at that moment, Nintendo was desperate because they didn't have enough budget to follow the path of the other two companies. And they said, okay, let's try something risky, because the market, market is not asking for this. But then people felt in love. There is a lot of research that shows that incremental change comes from users, radical change never, or very rarely. Okay. So that doesn't work. And it doesn't work simply because it's not only a marketing reason, but it's also a leadership reason why you need to start from the inside, not from the outside, when you do these kind of changes. And a few years ago, I was giving a speech with, with uh, uh, Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak was the co-founder of Apple. And then I asked him, and this guy's been the inventor of the first two personal computers in history. And he couldn't ask people, what do you want from a personal computer? Because what is a personal computer? No one even so and if, actually at that time the scenario was that people will only have mainframes. And then Steve told me, okay, you know, I had a club of people in, in, in Palo Alto and we were there and we were doing some tinkering around it. But then he stopped and said, no, hold on a second. Of course you design starting from yourself, something that you don't love. How can people love something that you don't love yourself? You do it for them, but you don't love it. And people will smell it in a millisecond that you do it for because of business, but not because you like it. And what typically happens is that if you don't believe in what you are designing, when you're doing something very radical, sooner or later there will be a problem in the project, as always. The more radical you are, the more there will be a market test that will not work, or a technology that doesn't fit. And if you don't really believe yourself in what you're doing, you stop. So the only way to do radical projects is that you love it yourself. You believe, okay, people will love it. They still don't know, but they will love it. And the third is that this kind of innovation has to come from the inside because it's strongly connected to value systems. I mean, you're changing the value, you're changing the meaning of things, the values of things in society. So when you're doing something better, okay, um, you don't ask yourself, what am I doing? Because it's already there. The, the value system, you're just improving things that exist. But when you change the meaning of things, and you're creating computers, or you're creating new art, or you're, creating, you're helping people playing by moving, you change the values around the world of gaming. Is it right? Is it not? A and this kind of innovation needs to come from the inside, because it's not just about creativity. It's your system of values that you project into society. This is a sentence of uh, Stefano Marzano. Stefano Marzano used to be the chief designer of Philips, and he said, of course, our more radical project never come from the user, it come from our vision. A and he says, I, I, I use the metaphor of the good parent. Who is a good parent? A good parent is not the one who gives these children what they want. Hello, Daddy, I would like some candies. What do you do? Do you give her the candies or? and there's no one else to, to ask that. I mean, you're there as a father, and you need to make your decision. And maybe you say, OK, no, there is a smoothie bar down there. I can offer you a banana smoothie. So you listen, of course. Yes, I have one of my earliest students, Mauro Porcini, is now the chief designer of Pepsi. And he says, of course you listen to the users, but don't believe them. Okay. So you listen to this girl. She needs sugars. OK. Can I make a proposal that is something more meaningful? So a parent gives them what is more meaningful for him. And there's no one else. If I'm a father, I need to decide what is more meaningful for her, actually, for the girls that I hope she will become. So I'm almost talking to my child when she will be 20 in that moment. 
in, in, even if I'm listening to a small girl. So uh, the first big difference in mindset is that when you improve solution, of course you start, if you want to improve this device, you need to start from the size of my hand because it needs to fit inside. But if we need to change the meaning of education, interaction, maybe the point is, do we really need to have this one? Maybe, maybe the word of Wikipedia, you should, you should keep this one. Everyone should have this one. And when we're ready, you change. Then it's not about, I mean, it's not something that we can design by asking people what they want from this. Is it, you need to step back and think about the big scenario. So it's what I call inside out. But then there is a second principle here that is, I mean, Steve Wozniak was very clever. He didn't say, people will love what you love. That would be fantastic. No, he said, people will not love what you don't love, which means if you don't love it, forget it. You will never make it. But then how can we be sure that what we see is exactly meaningful to people? And then we need a second principle. And the second principle is also this one very interesting, and I think for this community, it's probably even more challenging. Uh, and the second principle is very simple. It, 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 at the level of solution, when we want to improve solutions, after we've been understanding what users want, we do the classic you know, creative session. And again, I go back to the idea of design thinking, you know, post this, and blah, 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 which maybe 20 years ago made sense. But nowadays, we don't miss ideas. I mean, we are, we are overwhelmed by ideas and, and things. It, it's fine if you want to improve things, but if we, if we want to change the meaning of things, it's a little more complicated. Uh, and I use an example which is very close to you, uh, an example of, uh, of, uh, of Nokia. I mean, Nokia has been always considered to be the most innovative company in the world. And at that time, there were case studies in the in early 2000s about Nokia and Finland, the most creative, competitive economy here. And this fantastic uh, you know, Forbes, Nokia, one billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? Yes. Uh, the, the amazing thing here, however, and I like this, this cover, is that this cover is from November 12, 2007. Okay? So at that time, Steve Jobs already had presented the iPhone. And what is amazing here is that the CEO of Nokia is there with a the phone that looks from the last century, and, and, and not even the director of Forbes understood what's going on. No one understood. When I saw the iPhone the first time, I didn't understand. I, I, was, I will never buy that. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I have this one, $100, fantastic. Why should I buy a phone for $500? Okay. And Nokia, so the idea was there in front of their eyes. It's not that they missed the idea. The idea was there. They had all the technologies. They already had streaming, touch screen, the store, they had everything, but they missed the meaning, okay? Uh, and I like this sentence from, from the, oops, from the former CEO of Nokia, which say, most companies die not because they do the wrong things, but because they keep doing what used to be right for too long. So they had the technologies, but they did the, they used to keep doing the substitution, what used to be right, because the, what is the meaning of what we are doing? And, and, and for technology, the meaning what they are doing is it was written there, connecting people. What's wrong about that? Well, when Steve Jobs launched the iPhone, he didn't say this is to connect people. Actually, as a phone, it was quite crappy, very crappy. The first two years, it was better to use an old Nokia phone than use your iPhone in terms of connection. But he said, this is your life in your pocket. I mean, if you really want to make calls, you can make calls, but it's your life in your pocket. And this is not your life in your pocket, even if he has the same technology of the iPhone, unless your pocket is big like this. You see that in the frame of the engineers, they can't get rid of everything that is a phone. They can't get rid of the keyboard. They can't get rid of all features because it, it, we can do everything, but it's still a phone. I cannot compromise on the antenna. Apple compromised on the antenna because it was not the phone. So what does it mean? That this kind of innovation doesn't require ideas. The ideas were all there. I mean, they already saw the idea from, from, from Apple, and they were laughing about that. 
Microsoft was laughing. I have a video in the interview of Steve Borman. Everyone was laughing about that, even if the idea was there in their front of the eyes. So this kind of innovation doesn't require ideas because the idea is in front of us, but we don't see it because we use old glasses to judge it. It's like the Nintendo Wii. Ah, Microsoft said, well, teenagers don't want it. Anymore. Where is the graphics there? Poor graphics, they will never buy it. So you're judging change with the glasses of the past. So the only way to do this innovation is to not to have more and more idea, but to change the glasses that we use to look at ideas. And this is what is called capability of being self-critical, or what is called in technical terms sometimes reframing. So we need to change frames. I like this sense by Umberto Galimberti, he's a philosopher, and, and he says, to understand the world that changes, we, we must revisit our myth. We must subject them to criticism. The myth are the glasses that we use to judge things. So we don't need more ideas, we need to cure the ideas that we use to interpret life, okay? So as a summary on this finding, when you try to improve solution, you start from the outside, go to the user, trying to understand the problem, and then you need a lot of idea to solve those problems. But when you find a new meaning, okay, we have a new technology, what is the real meaning of this? How can we really change the sense of what we are doing? It's the opposite process, you start from the inside, Take a distance, look at how society is changing, the big system, make sense of it. But then you need to be ready to reframe what you see because otherwise you keep seeing what you want to see. If you start from the inside, you need to be honest with yourself and slowly, slowly, slowly see the new. Okay, we can skip this. So, let's go back to our challenges. Uh, so this is what we learn about how you create new meaning. Now we have a new technology here, which is artificial intelligence. And, and we see that the first application are exactly like in the past. Let's try to emulate what humans did better, cheaper, faster. But we still didn't see the real epiphany here. So we know that to find an epiphany, we need two things. Someone who have the capability from the inside to imagine new possibilities but who is also ready to reframe what is the meaning of art, what is the meaning of being an artist. Otherwise, we judge the next experiment with the old eyes. A and my feeling, and now I'm entering to speculation, so, so uh, is that in front of this epic change, uh, we, we discussed this, the, my feeling is that in front of the epic change, we, the, the usual will happen, that, uh, while in the, in terms of, I can go back, let me just show you this, because in terms of inside out, this community, uh, and this community I include the art community, the architecture community, they are very good in imagining from the inside out, okay? I, I teach also a course that is called Design Theory and Practice at the Harvard Business School, a and I co-teach with a professor from the School of Design for, of Harvard, which is basically a school of architecture, it's not the school of industrial design. In Polytechnic, I've always been working with colleagues in which the School of Design is rooted in the School of Architecture. So I love architects, okay? Uh, and why? Because they design like this. They design from the inside out. They never answer to the, I, I asked to, to one of my old mentor in design, it was named Ezio Manzini. Ezio Manzini has been a fantastic theory of design. It's, and I say, Ezio, Ezio, why in Italy design is so radical? And he said, design in Italy is radical because it comes, from, it comes from architecture, not from engineering. And architects, of course, they are used, uh, I mean, they are trained not to listen to the user, okay? Which in, in engineering school, we make jokes of them. But it's right, because, I mean, if you're designing a building, who is the user of that building? I mean, the person who pays you has a life cycle which is 10 times shorter than the building. Why should I listen to this person if this building will survive for centuries? I'm responsible to the centuries, not to this person. Thank you for giving me the money, but I'm thinking that that's the point, okay? Which is why a, a good investor in architecture should be also thinking about, it's not for me. If I invest in architecture, it's for the future. And then an architect is used to think about society. Who is the user of a building? It's not only the people who live inside, it's the citizens who live around. So they are typically systemic 
and you know, they never get close to the user. They look at the big picture and try to make sense. This is why I love to have my courses with, the, with architects and not with industrial designers, because otherwise I need to keep fighting about brainstorming and user center and all this kind of thing. They don't work for creating new meaning. So the, fr the left side of the picture is fantastic for this community. What I'm more concerned is the right side, is the critical reflection, because art communities and everything that is around creativity, they believe they are good in reframing, but most of the time they, have, they are very creative, difficult and challenging in reframing. And there are many, many examples in the past that was showing what happened, in the, what happened when the camera was invented. Okay, a group of young guys, they didn't think about the camera, but they were just, you know, they were in their 20s. They were students in the school in, in, in Paris they started to do different things. And they wanted to paint in pixels. So they say, I, I don't paint what is, you know, I paint what I see. And, 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 and they proposed this painting, uh, Women in the Garden, uh, by Claude Monet. And as you know the story, this painting was refused, okay? And it was refused badly, okay? And this was the sentence of one of the judges, okay? Too many young people think of nothing but continuing in this abominable direction, okay? It is time to protect them and save the art. Uh, these were just bad artists with the standards of that time, with the frame of judgment at that time. So this is a person who is unable to reframe. And, uh, Talking about most recent events in the world of architecture, I mean, again, when you're designing, when you're designing, I don't know, they took for example, these are designs of, of bookshelves, okay? When you design bookshelf, you can be a creative and can have thousands of ways of doing a bookshelf. But in the 80s in Milan, a, a, a crazy guy and, and a small movement of thing was called Memphis, started to do things that didn't really make sense. You are probably in the School of Architecture, you know very well what I'm talking about when I talk about Memphis and postmodernism. And what is very funny at that time, uh, at Resozas, is the designer of this, this, this uh, uh, do you know this? Uh, you, you've been seeing this? No, ah, this is very painful. So then I need to go back. So at Resozas was a, an architect in Milan in, in the 80s, uh, and he started a movement which is called postmodernism. So it was an answer to the, all this, you know, very rational, you can be creative, but the idea is, a bookshelf is to keep books, which is, makes sense, okay? Of course, this bookshelf is not to keep books, okay? Uh, it's it a playfulness around emotion, and it's to say, okay, why should we really be serious in our apartment? It's not about, apartments are not done to squeeze people in rational ways. People live in their houses, they have emotions, okay? A and of course, the critic at that time we're making jokes of, of this kind of thing. So not the customers, people love that. It was the critic in the industry were criticizing it's at Resozza. So, and then he, he said, this is one of the senses that I like. I'm always offended when they, and they are the architect critics, say that I play when I do Memphis work. Actually, I'm very serious because it was doing experiment. Is when I, I'm never more serious than when I do Memphis work, is when I design machine for Olivetti, he was a famous designer for, of typewriters at that time for, for Olivetti, then I play. Okay. So that was very serious, but no one understood. And then I will show later what kind of impact this kind of process had in, in, in our life. And finally, an example from just a couple of years ago, uh, I don't know if what happens to you when you go to another city, you go visiting, I don't know, uh, uh, painting museums, you know, in Italy you go to the Uffizi in Florence, in Paris you go to the Musée d'Orsay, uh, but you never go to a photography museum when you visit a city. I mean, it never happened to me to visit a photography museum. This is the photography museum of New York, very empty. This is the photography museum of London, not so empty, but a little bit sad. Okay. Uh, okay, with all the photos there. Uh, uh, why should you even go to a photography museum nowadays when you can see photos on your phone? So it doesn't really make sense. And yet, you probably know it that in Stockholm, in this moment, one of the coolest places to be is a photography museum. 
invented by these two guys who are the Brahma brothers. Uh, and, and, uh, and then I said, okay, let me go there. Uh, then I took the metro and I went there and, and uh, uh, 300 meters, I, I, I stopped a second because I saw this sign. I said, no, hold on, hold on. I need to take a photo here. Well done. Now you're only 300 meters left to photographica. Come and check our photos. No. Treat yourself in our cafe. Hold on, what's going on there? Isn't that a museum about photography? And instead, photographica is it's a place you go, of course, to look at the photography. But you go also because there is the best restaurant, museum restaurant in the world, rated the best museum restaurant in the world. It's a fantastic cafe, view. You can go there, meet your friends. The amazing thing is that this is not only for a visit, they even manage to have subscriptions. So there is people that is going there frequently in a photography museum because they have continuous exhibition, open in the night, fantastic cafe. That's the reason why you go there. What is the reaction of the world of us? So these are a few examples. So very immersive and experience. I mean, that looks totally different. You're there to watch the photo. You're here, you're there to be immersed. This is the opening of the, uh, is the photographic in New York. It's a fantastic building. Again, great cafe, great situation, great place where you want to meet people. What is the reaction of the critics? That's the New York Times when uh, Photographic and New York open. Uh, a gorgeous center for photography, far from picture perfect. Photographic at the New York Outpost of the Critics Swedish Institute is an architectural gem, but the exhibited photographs don't live up the decor. What kind of photography is this one? It's fashion photography, music photography. That's not real photography, okay? which is exactly what they want to do. They want to show every kind of possible contemporary photography to stimulate the mind of people, okay? So superficial and, pre oh, sorry, maybe you can go back here. Superficial and predictable photography. The photographs exhibited at photographic are not worth going out for, especially as the admission fee is $28. And people have a subscription. So what I'm afraid is that when you have in front of these big changes of meaning, what we miss here is not the inside out. That's, that's this community is very strong. It's the capability to reframe what is good and what is bad. So I expect that I see it already happening. There will be a lot of critique. Ah, that's not art. It's a machine. What is art? So what will happen uh, uh, in the future is that I expect there will be a lot of uh, fantastic era of ferment. A lot of people doing a lot of things. And the critic that will say, this is right and this is wrong, this is with the old glasses, this is right and this is wrong. But if we've luckily now, there will be crazy young guys who are still doing crazy things. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I hope that we will stop asking the question. I hope I will, can help you reframe the question. Because the question is not if the machine will take our space. For sure, it will take the space of the old creators. <sighs> I'm sorry, it's like this. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the machine will take the space of creators. It will take the space of the old creators. But there will be new creators who will create fantastic stuff with these machines. So the question is, who is the new creator? Not whether the machine will take our space. It will never happen. Is the old people is just scared, but it's normal. I don't mean old in age. I'm, I'm 25, as you, as you can understand. Uh, but, but old in the frames, okay? You can be fantastically new when you're 95 if you change your frames. So who is taking the space of the existing creators? That's the fantastic question. Where does it come from? I don't know, but we can take some inspiration from some movies, okay? By the way, this digital movies are fantastic. I can imagine when digital movies started to happen, oh, there will not be any cartoon makers and so on. There is, the industry is growing. There is everything happening. But this is a fantastic movie. This one, I hope you know it. OK. Uh, <laughs> and this movie is fantastic because the entire dilemma of the movie is around a question. And the question, there is you know, this old, there is a chef who passed away, and this chef said, Everyone can be a chef. And then there's the critic says, nah, not everyone can be a chef. Only great chef can be chef. 
they need to be go to school and do their things and this is and suddenly uh, who reinvented the way of cooking in that movie is the most unexpected player something that the critics say this actually you call the police if you know there is a rat in the kitchen okay so what will happen is this one <laughs> the new creator will come from something and what i like is uh, so the new who the new creator will defy the definition of how we define a creator today that's what will change if we judge the new creation with the glasses of the old creators we will never get it and i like this center we come at the end of the movie that say no one can be a great artist and it's not that everyone is allowed to do everything but a great artist can come from anywhere and we don't know yet where it is coming for the future that's the reason why i think it's an exciting moment we are there in the moment everyone can be there okay the question for me, who, I, I, I'm, I'm not an artist, I'm, I'm studying the industry, is who will be those who recognize them? So who will be the first one to say, wow, that guy is doing fantastic thing? Who was the first one to put their money on, on an impressionist painting? And we have the answer in the movie. Who recognize the new artist? This guy, unbelievable. The most unexpected person eventually who is the first one who recognized the talent. And it, it, this movie is, is a fantastic, we need to re watch it three times before to understand uh, uh, artificial intelligence because this guy is, is it's, it's amazing. For, for the entire three quarter of a movie is the most conservative critic of kitchen and cuisine and whatever. But then at the end, suddenly, when he's in front of this rat, and he says, okay, you've been eating a ratatouille, and this ratatouille, which you loved a lot. Oh, yeah, it was good, isn't it? It's been cooked by a rat. And he's there. I turn left, call the police. I turn right. You know what? I build a restaurant with this guy. And he's there in the night thinking, 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 and finally it makes what is called a reframing. Ah, okay, not everyone can be a great, I, I was right in the sense that no one can be a, a great artist, but he was also right, a great artist can come from anywhere. And by the way, the movie is fantastic because it doesn't get that rational in. If someone would have told him, now you will eat a ratatouille cooked by a rat, he would call the police. But in the movie, it's the, it's the story is the opposite. He first eats the ratatouille, reconnect to some emotion, which typically is what will happen. Someone will open up and say, okay, hold on a second. I need to go out of my frame. I'm not the judge anymore. I'm a child. Connect to my mom. Open up the eyes. I like it. Now I go back. I'm a critic again, but I have this tension between my belly and my head. And I hold this tension for a while. And eventually, this solution in terms of new frame come. And what is very nice in terms of leadership is that, and again, the, the masterpiece of this movie is that you cannot get there if you don't change yourself. You cannot be the same judge as before and just change your frame. You change your life. So the guy, this is fantastic. The, the, the metamorphosis of Antoine go between the guy before and the guy after. His, everything is the smile, the fashion, everything is another person so it's not only the artist that will change it's also the entire industry around that will change it cannot stay the same so this is what probably will happen is not will this machine take our space the machine will take the space of all creators but it will be new creators and they're all around and we need to be ready to recognize them by changing our frame so, is this a fantastic opportunity? I believe it is. I believe we are in the front of that. And since I got this news, and then, so when we met a few months ago, I was not so excited. But I've never been so excited like today, because I think this technology now has reached a point of a tipping point in which it really become 
wow, we can do things for real now. Okay. And, uh, and it's opening up opportunities to have impact. So for the first time, for the first time not, but there are moments in history of creative industry where you have impact beyond the world of creativity. The world of art has always been connected to the world of art, the world of architecture between architecture. But there have been moments in history in which the impact of what you do goes beyond your industry. And this example was to mention uh, uh, what the impact of Memphis and eventually, this was an experiment, of course. Yes, they, they were sold to rich people, of course, very expensive, but they were just experiments. At the, at the border between architecture, design, and art. But then, Ettore Sozza was working for Alessi uh, as a designer, and most of his intuition about emotion went into this fantastic product that Alessi did in the 90s, playful kitchenware without any kind of functionality but it was very successful. And then eventually in, in, in Bookshell, that was very successful by Cartel in plastic. And then eventually Apple, uh, Jonathan Ive, this was the first product he did. It was very connected. He, had, he bought a product by Alessi to take inspiration. How do you design the first ever computer, this one, that is meant to be in a home instead of an office? It needs to speak the language of the home. And what is the language of the home? This one. And so, uh, this crazy research, it was more visionary, eventually had an impact in our life. And I believe that our community of creative industry in this moment has a fantastic opportunity to have impact that goes much beyond our own industries, in our own community. I mean, this is an example of a company called Akili, just went public uh, last week. It's a Turkish company. They are designing games to treat mental diseases. They got approval from FDA in the, in the, in the US. They, was, they went to NASDAQ last week, extremely successful, changing the meaning of games. And games will have a huge impact. We already know that in the young communities, games now, are, if you use Discord or this kind of thing, these are the social, they don't use Facebook, they use Discord to, 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 to communicate. So they are going beyond games. And fashion is, is becoming an in unbelievably impactful in terms of experiments in society. I was talking to a chief designer of Pininfarina uh, in August and said, oh, of course I always, I mean, I, when I design cars, I, I believe, I, I look a lot at fashion because they can do experiments in a quite fast, quick way that we cannot do when we design cars. So they have a freedom of expression. So the way we will use our things and the way we design our creative community will have an impact much beyond what we see. Okay. So this is to say there is, if you're ready to reframe, uh, we are in a good moment to have an impact that is amazing. I believe it's a fantastic moment. I'm full of enthusiasm. Thank you. <laughs> Indeed. I'm sure there are comments. Here. Yeah. Kuidas on tulla? Näiteks subakooli või või võtta siis kuskil mõjalde täiskursust? Well, you have to go to the Stockholm Business School, of course. <laughs> How to come to your courses? How to come to my course? Uh, we can talk later. I don't want to. <laughs> uh, 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 I need to digitalize myself more, but uh, uh, my courses are. I don't do summer schools, schools yet, um, because I'm, in August I'm teaching in, in Harvard, so it's, it's, it's very time consuming. But uh, it's a good question, so it makes me think. <laughs> I don't have an answer. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure we can organize something here as well. Okay. 
I'm, I'm sure. That's another idea. <laughs> I, well, I got the question indirectly. So, yes, uh, right. it's we've, feasible. We've, we've got to the solution part. Now we go to the meaning part. Are there any more <laughs> questions? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, you, you make the point. No, no, no. It's the question, do we really av need to avoid talking to, to the users? Or, uh, 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 exactly. So let me take the second one. Do we need radical change? Uh, I, that's a very good question. I don't know, but, it's, but it happens anyway. So, so, uh, so it's something that happens and it's always been happening in history that there is two, the, both things. There is incremental and radical. So uh, is it really needed? But what we will have, I mean, with this artificial intelligence, there will be a radical change. Uh, it, it's inevitable. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unstoppable. Uh, so either we can uh, try to put our finger into the dam, but the dam will, will or we need to embrace it and, and actually drive it in a direction that it makes more sense. So uh, maybe it's not an answer. Maybe, I don't know if we need it or not, but it will, it will happen. And historically, there is always like this. And there are always some human who have an advantage of making bigger leap. And you, it's, we want to leave free freedom to people to do it if they want to do it. Uh, the first question, it is, uh, you ca totally capture my point. I tend to be, of course, a little bit provocative. Uh, but uh, to be very precise, uh, when you design cities, when you design a building, of course, you, you can still listen to that person. But it's really one out of a thousand people you need to listen. Okay. So, uh, you need to listen to that person, but you need to imagine what people in the next generation. So you need to listen, and you cannot. So you need to start from yourself. Listen to those who will come in the centuries. Listen to the citizens who live around. Listen to uh, the impact. I mean, there are so many scenarios in this moment popping up on urban design. Now I saw yesterday there's this idea of the ring around the Burki Khalifa in, 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 in Dubai. There is the city that is going to be designed in, in, in what is the line, this 170 kilometer. I mean, big scenarios. I, I mean, if you want to design this, not, not only the impact on who is living there, there is a lot of impact, systemic impact. So we need to listen. I, what I believe that an architect needs to listen to the ecosystem, one of which, but only one of which is the, is the client, is an entire ecosystem, which is different people, nature, we need to be listened as well, and things, because increasingly what you design is interacting not only with people, what you design is interacting also with other things. So when you design mobility in a city, most of the time you design for a, for a, for a scooter who's interacting with a car, who's interacting with, so, so it's the number of things we need to listen is huge. It's so so I, of course I try to be provocative, you, you, but, to be precise, it's very different to, to design for an ecosystem than designing for a user. And, and design thinking has been proposed in the last 20 years, really, userism. 
at large. In fact, we don't have a better society after 20 years design thinking. We don't have a more sustainable, if you look at all the products that pop up, thousands of incrementally better products that, that eventually after 20 years of design thinking, we have a more unsustainable society. No one is taking responsibility of stepping back from the user and say, oh no, I know the users like it, but is, does it really make sense? Okay. So uh, you, you capture my point. I, I, I'm a little bit provocative. You, you can still listen to the user, but not only to that. That's the point, as, especially if you're architects. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I was wondering, um, I think technological change um, can give all kind of opportunities, but the question that sort of came up when I was listening to your talk is that, is every epiphany um, a good thing? Hmm. It's very similar to the question before. <sighs> Uh, and then, then uh, when we move at the level of, that's the point, when we move from the level of solution to the level of meaning, we start to compare frames and system of values. So it's very difficult to say yes or not. It's when we move at the lower level. So if we have a frame, we can judge, is this solution better or wrong or not? So it is, is, is an iPhone a better phone or not? Not. It was not a better phone, but it was a, your, your life in your pocket. Is your life in your pocket better than a phone? And then you move at the level of values in which everyone has the, the only thing I can say is that we, we the only thing is to, is to have a conversation about that because everyone comes with this personal system of value. This is why it is inside out. And the only way is to have a dialogue. Okay, let me see what I don't see. Not because I believe in something different. What, 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 I'm, what is important, I'm not saying you believe in some values, I believe in something, it's different. This is, this is politics. But what I think for, for a designer is that maybe I see something, but I don't see the systemic impact of what I'm doing. So a dialogue with you will help me to see, okay, but you know what, if you do that, example, Tesla, fantastic, and so on, and so, great vision. But maybe someone come and say, hold on a second, what if you scale up these two, two billion cars? Where do we put all these batteries? Ooh, hey, I didn't think about that. So at least you make me see things that I didn't see, okay? Because you have a different system of value, you see things that I did. So, so it's, to say, it's difficult to say, is it a Tesla better than a traditional car? I think it would be very difficult. But at least the dialogue helped us see unintended consequences that not because I'm bad, but simply because I'm framing to it I didn't see before. That's, a, a sort of that's still a kind of uh, maybe technological thinking because it, it shouldn't the question be really much about what kind of different kind of life it's creating, or what kind of vision for humanity it has, or how it could impact. That, uh, what kind of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I understand. That's the only space I struggle to enter, because it's, it's, it's then we enter into the politics of things. And mm. design is doing politics, as we know. So, but uh, it's very difficult to judge if my vision is, at that level, is more meaningful than yours. I believe that for the values I have, life of people should be in a given way. Uh, and maybe you have, uh, and it's, again, also in politics is the dialogue around things. It's very difficult to find, to find a solution at that level if my values are right and your values are wrong or vice versa because it's, uh, hmm. otherwise everyone would vote for the same things in the election, for example. That, that, I mean, we, we have different system of values. And, and but is it an individual choice? I think there is an economical system now which is quite dominant. That's the neoliberal model. Uh, designers have been trained uh, to work, to design experiences. Those experiences are designed to a large extent to sell as products, to enlarge profits. As Yuria showed, 
how strong those companies are today. And they, uh, I would say, if we look negatively, they spit doctor a kind of way we should behave, a kind of humanity which is being produced, which I think is rather problematic. So uh, I think that I, I very much agree that creativity and working with the unintended consequences and the opportunities of technology offer a chance, and it's very valid. But we also know that uh, that techniques of the cultural industry are in a way hijacked to, to construct all kinds of experiences. And the question always avoided is to talk about the values. And we know that the neoliberal system for 35 years now has brought us a lot of problems. Yeah. This is the very, very important point. Uh, and I go back, uh, this, this summer, I can tell you, share a story. This summer, uh, as I said, I was teaching in Harvard and, and we invited Ferrari to give us a brief, okay? Ferrari in this moment is challenged a lot because as engines are moving to electric engines, for example, one of the myths of Ferrari is the noise of the engine, which is fantastic. And what is the noise of a, an electric car? And, and how do you interact with human machine? Uh, and that was a very controversial or, or, or polemic, as my co-teacher from, from the architecture. So it was a very polemic brief, because why should, we, why should we design for rich people? Does it really make sense? And after long discussions like this and so on, and this is, uh, by the way, what is very interesting in this moment that students that attend business school are much more uh, uh, sensitive to the purpose and impact of what they do than students in design school. Because 20 years of happiness in design school, and every, you know, now a lot of design con uh, consultants, sorry, a lot of strategic consultancy, McKinsey, Deloitte, they have all been buying design companies, okay? Which is my pity. Why didn't I start a design company? I would be super rich. Uh, too lost, too late. So designers in this, most of the designers that we train in industrial design, especially in service design, they work for Deloitte, uh, Accenture, McKinsey, uh, EY. So, so, and instead the students that come to business school, there's, they really want to change the world for the better. So it's a very strange situation, which is the other twist. Is, is, so it's more the design community that is supporting that kind of thinking than the business community, which is totally crazy. Anyway, so these students of, a design, of the business school tell, I don't feel like to design for Ferrari. And, and, and my answer was, do you want to change the world? You change it through the way you design. Then you can, of course, go and vote for a difficult, different political system. That's, that's politics, it's voting. But every time we design, we do a political act. And so if you design for Ferrari, you design a different way of being in a Ferrari. Then they can listen or not, but you take your responsibilities. And, and it was a very deep conversation because uh, the conversation started to rise up you know, on profit and, and, and they say, you know, we are not here to change the political system, we are here to talk about design. Then if we ch open another door and we enter another room, we can talk about politics, whatever. But here, we can change the world as designers. So someone has been working for Facebook, has been designed that little things with a the, with the thumb up. Someone has been designing that, has been paying, taking a salary for that. Who was the designer? So we talk about about, about uh, uh, what's the name, Zuckerberg, but we don't talk about the designer. So Zuckerberg is Zuckerberg, but who is that mm -hmm. damn designer? They did that. Did he take responsibility? Was he thinking about what he was doing? Was it inside out or outside in? <laughs> so uh, we can do a lot in our communities to, to explain to our students we have responsibility. Any moment in which we start to think, yes, but it's society that is wrong, it's an escape from our responsibility. We say, okay, society is wrong, and one day I will make the revolution. But meanwhile, I'm here, and I'm making my own design, and I can do a little bit of a contribution, much more powerful than voting, because it's just one vote. But as a designer, instead, you change the life of many people. And if I don't believe in what I do, sorry, I don't do it, I change job. Are you ready? Otherwise, we are joking. Are you ready to say, no, I don't do that? Or even better, don't do that. 
you come up with an idea that is better, both in terms of business and in terms of society, because that's the, that's the point. It's not either or, it's not profit or society. Great designers make both. You know what? I have an idea that doesn't I ask you to sacrifice as a, as a business leader, and it doesn't ask you people to sacrifice. And that's, I'm the designer who need to take care of both. That's what we need to learn. But if you compromise, you're not a good designer. I don't know if I took care. Because otherwise we take a strange detour and 